Hello and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press webinar. I'm Alastair Horn from Cambridge and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm very pleased to welcome Pauline Cullen as today's presenter. Pauline has taught in the UK, Spain, Hong Kong and Australia and has been working with Cambridge English since 1995. Over to you, Pauline. Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. And today we're going to focus on the writing skills section of the IELTS test. Writing skills bring about their own problems, which are quite different to the other skills we've talked about. One of my Facebook followers recently shared his IELTS test score with me. He took the general training test and got a reading score of 7, a listening score of 8.5, a speaking score of 7.5, and a writing score of 6. It's quite common to find this kind of profile in IELTS, where the writing score is often the lowest. The following were comments made by another candidate who so far managed to get a band 6 and is trying for a band 7. And he said, to be honest, I'm not good with words. I love to study numbers and work with numbers. Because of that, I didn't concentrate on grammar at school. Now I find it difficult to recover that type of study. This highlights a key issue with tests like IELTS, where people who don't feel as though they're natural language learners need to build and develop language skills. He also made this point. I found so many grammar rules, and sometimes more than two or three grammar rules apply in one sentence. So I'm wondering how you manage to remember all the rules and apply them in writing. And here, I think he's pinpointing the frustration of the band 5 and band 6 candidate. They typically feel stuck at this level where controlled practice is still very necessary. They don't know how to get to the point where they can speak or write without consciously thinking of rules and without making so many errors. In my last webinar, I used the analogy of IELTS students swimming in a pool. I'm going to use a different analogy for the writing test, which I want to compare to cooking. So in the controlled practice stage of bands 5 and 6, your students are still very dependent on following instructions and being guided through any process. What they need is to get to the stage where the whole language process comes naturally to them. First, a reminder of how the IELTS writing test is assessed. There are four different criteria used to assess each writing task. The first is task response or task achievement as it's known in writing task 2. This focuses on the ideas you've presented in your task. The next is coherence and cohesion, which considers the way you've organized those ideas as well as how clear they are. And finally, there are lexical resource and grammatical range and accuracy. We'll look at the words and phrases you've used. The reason I've presented them this way is to show that 50% of the score is related to the ideas you choose to present and the way that you choose to present them. I also think that it's significant that the two elements of task response and coherence and cohesion are listed first and second. So it stands to reason then that these should be an important focus of any IELTS preparation course. On this slide, you can see part of the public version of the descriptors of these criteria. And these are available on the official IELTS website. As you can see, there's a lot of information and too much for us to go through in detail here. And I also think it's quite difficult for self-study students to understand how they're going wrong and what they need to aim for. So I'm hoping you'll bear with me as I continue with my cooking analogy and try to simplify this a little. So what do you need to do to score a band 6 or 7 or 8? Let's look at writing task 1. We often refer to task 1 in the academic module as describing visual information. And in general training, we say the task is to write a letter. But that only gives a partial picture of the tasks and is much too simplistic. In fact, the writing test for both academic and general training is asking you to show that you can write in a very precise and accurate way. In the academic module, you're being asked to summarize the information you're given and you're told what this means. The question says you need to select and report the main features. You're also asked to make any comparisons where relevant. Below band 6, 
Candidates simply describe what they see, which is not what this task asks you to do. In general training, you're given a situation to respond to in the form of a letter, and you're also given three clear bullet points to include. For example, you might be asked to describe something, explain why, and recommend something. Again, below band six, candidates miss out these key points or don't cover each of them fully enough. I'm going to try to illustrate these different levels with our cooking analogy. So imagine that the task is to make something to eat, but the task doesn't stop there. It has some very specific elements and ingredients that you're asked to include. A band eight or above response would look like this. And you can see that the task is completed successfully and that each of the different elements given in the task are very clearly present. The descriptors tell us that the ideas are all relevant, extended and supported. A band seven response would look like this. So again, all of the elements are present, but the, low re the end result sorry, is not quite as successful. What starts to creep in here, and as we go lower in the bands, is a lack of clarity and a lack of balance in the ideas being presented. The descriptor tells us that there may be a tendency to overgeneralize, and supporting ideas may lack focus. At band six, again, all of the elements are present, but some parts may be more fully covered than others. Sorry, I've got the wrong slide there. There it is. So all the elements are present, but some parts may be more fully covered than others. By band five, some of the key elements or details are missing, and some details may be inappropriate or inaccurate. There may be no data to support the description. And remember that IELTS is a formal qualification used for university entry or with general training for professional reasons. So just as with English A-level, a native speaker won't automatically receive top marks and could potentially be given a band 5 for task response if they don't address the specific task they're given. And at the band 4 stage, attempts at the task are even less successful, with parts that are unclear, irrelevant, repetitive or inaccurate. So let's look at the same issue from the point of view of writing task 2. We tend to descri describe this as writing an essay, but the task is again a lot more focused and precise than that. Your question or topic will always contain one, more than one element, like this or this. So you're being asked to weigh up and discuss those elements equally. You also need to give reasons for your answer and include relevant examples from your own knowledge or experience. Again, band six and above do this with varying degrees of success. The difference is in the clarity of their argument, the way that the ideas are organized and connected, as well as the quality of the language used. And again, candidates below band six don't cover all of these points. To go back to our cooking analogy, if writing task one is like making a specific sandwich, then we might see writing task two as creating a soup with a careful balance of flavors. Some candidates try to learn answers to use in the test. And if they do this, then they won't respond fully to the task, which as we've seen has a very specific focus. They're doing the equivalent of this. This is how the examiner sees a learned answer. The contents of this tin of soup won't contain the precise ingredients they were asked for, and the fact that it's manufactured will be very apparent. And just as the can of soup doesn't tell me anything about your cooking skills, your learned answer doesn't tell the examiner anything about your writing skills, so you'll receive a very low score. From a teaching point of view, it's very important to be aware that you're training your students to become language learners, particularly when it comes to writing skills. Think back to the candidate I mentioned at the beginning who's struggling with language learning. You shouldn't assume that students automatically have skills like organizing ideas, even in their own language. And this is where the cooking analogy is again useful. It shows these are skills we all need to learn 
they don't come naturally to us. Writing is the skill we practice less and less in the real world, and that also tends to happen in the classroom. Think back to the IELTS score we saw at the beginning and consider how closely that imbalance equates to the time students actually spend writing in the classroom compared to reading, for example. It's common for teachers to relegate writing to a homework task, and a course book will typically introduce new ideas with a speaking, reading, or listening task, and we tend to see writing as the very last stage in learning. Because of that, it's easy to run out of time and not get around to too much writing in the classroom. So try to find a way to promote writing within your course. One way to do this is to convert one of your speaking activities to a writing activity. So instead of asking students to chat to each other, get them to write to each other. You should also encourage your students to write by hand as much as possible. Their handwriting must be clearly legible in the test, and so they need to practice this. They also need to get a feel for what 150 or 250 of their own words looks like on the page. And that can save them time when it comes to counting in the exam. As we said earlier, up to band six, your students still need a lot of controlled practice. And it's very easy to limit this to grammar and vocabulary, as there are plenty of exercises like that to be found. But as we've seen, these are only half of the picture, and they're also not even the most essential half of the picture when it comes to your writing. So let's look at ways to develop skills related to task response and cohesion in a controlled way. So for task response at band six, you can see that it's important to work on the details that they present in their answer. As we've seen, the writing tasks are very precise, and so the details need to be accurate and precise as well. For academic writing, don't assume your students know how to pretend how to interpret information that's presented in a graph or chart. Before doing any writing tasks, use checking questions to focus on this. A true, false, or not given format is a good one to use. Another way to practice this is to put your students in pairs. Give one of them the data and the other a blank piece of paper. One student has to describe the data while the other tries to draw it. Or it could be an information gap activity where they each have only half of the information and need to fill in the gaps by describing the information they have. For general training, a good way to check for task response is to get your students to work backwards from their answer to recreate the bullet points they were given. If they've covered them well, this will be an easy task. If they've missed any bullet points out, this will soon become clear. For task achievement in writing task two, the main problems are in making sure that ideas are relevant, clear, and fully developed. In my view, the only way that you can do this is to be sure to plan before writing. If you help your students to develop a fixed way of planning, this will become a natural part of their writing process, something they automatically do. And I'll talk about some ideas for that in a moment. Another way to help you focus on planning in a controlled way is to take an essay and work backwards from it to reconstruct the plan. You could do this with the model answers you find in course books. So here are some suggestions for planning, but it's important to point out that this is only one suggested approach. So I suggest they begin by brainstorming their ideas. Then decide which ideas are not relevant or helpful and cut these out. Next, return to the question to check they've covered all of the elements equally. They could then decide which order to logically put their ideas in and decide which ideas go together and this will help them to create paragraphs. Using a framework like this one here can help provide a very clear visual of where there are any gaps in their answer. So here I've suggested they begin by first deciding what their position is. This position needs to be very, made very clear all the way through their answer if they want to achieve a band seven or eight. They then need to identify two different sides to the topic or question and use these as headings to note down their different ideas. This particular framework also forces them to give 
supporting evidence and relevant examples, which again are essential for band 7 or 8. Working from this, you can focus on the ideas they have under each heading, and then move on to look at how to clearly express these ideas and how to connect them together. So this same framework can neatly tie into working on cohesion and coherence. At band 6, the descriptors mention that cohesion may be mechanical at this level, so not used in a natural way. This might be because we tend to focus on exercises devoted to only one form of cohesion at a time. In past webinars, I've recommended using test materials as teaching resources and said that the reading passages make good models for writing. Here's a suggestion for focusing on cohesion and grammatical accuracy in a controlled way, but without just being limited to one language point. So I've suggested taking one paragraph from a reading passage you've already completed and removing all of the connectors. I've also taken out prepositions and articles and changed the verbs to the infinitive. The students have to try to recreate the original paragraph. Each diagonal line represents something missing. So this is a controlled way with a fixed outcome to get your students producing higher level language. When it comes to controlled practice, it's important to repeat it often until that natural control is achieved and they're producing sentence structures like this themselves in their own writing. Consider the chefs we referred to earlier. How often do you imagine they had to do a basic task like chopping an onion in their early days of cooking before they were able to build up speed and accuracy in the task and move on to working with more adventurous ingredients? So once they're ready for free practice and writing whole essays without guidance, more gaps in their knowledge begin to emerge. And this is why controlled practice is best for bands four and five. I've put together some typical errors taken from the Cambridge corpus. So these are errors made by candidates at band 6 and 7. And the errors are all shown in red. The first one here is an example of an idea that should have been cut from the essay plan. Given giving a definition of the word prison does not belong logically in a conclusion. In the second example, cohesion is the problem. And in the next two, vocabulary. The first is an example of attempting to use less common vocabulary, which is characteristic of a good band 7 candidate. The second example is a typical slip that can easily occur if there's checking at the end, so the candidate has the instead of they. And the final example is a tense problem. But when you're reviewing writing, I think it's a good idea to make your students aware of how their errors fit into the four criteria. So you could perhaps have a poster on the wall like this, where more examples are added as they come up throughout the, your course. One final point about control is that it's very important to work at the appropriate level. The fact that your students are aiming for band 7 should not be the starting point when it comes to choosing suitable materials. It's their current level that's important. Band 5 candidates will not benefit greatly from advanced or band 7 level materials. Controlled practice at the right level will build up over time to eventually become the more natural language production we mentioned earlier. But using higher level materials when your students aren't ready will have this effect. So there'll be gaps in their knowledge that will show very clearly. So build up skills gradually and work at the right level. So, if you have band 7 students who are aiming for band 7, whenever you ask them to complete a writing task, I'd suggest you always begin by focusing on what they should be aiming for. Here, I've taken key words and phrases from the band 7 descriptors and turned them from a description of language to a set of instructions. So, if they want to score band 7, for writing task 1, they should aim to present a clear overview of the main trends or stages, or for general training, the bullet points. For task 2, they should present a clear position throughout the task. For all writing tasks, they need to logically organize the information and use a range of cohesive devices. They need to present a clear central idea in each paragraph. They should use a sufficient range 
vocabulary to show some flexibility and precision, and make sure there are only occasional errors in word formation and spelling. And when it comes to grammatical range and accuracy, they should aim to use a variety of complex structures with frequent error-free sentences. So beginning with a clear goal in mind can help to remind them that they're doing much more than simply describing data, writing a letter, or writing an etta, a letter, or writing an essay, sorry. OK, thank you very much, everyone. I'll hand back over to Alistair. And just a reminder that you can find me in the following places if you want more suggestions and help. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks very, very much, Pauline. I've um, got a lot of questions, so I'll go straight into those. That was really interesting, though. Um, first question is from Cynthia Lamb. And she asks, are the four parts of the assessment criteria all equally assessed? Does it matter? Does it vary if I am aiming at a different band score? So, um, yeah, they are all equally um, assessed in the same it, for each band score. It, it doesn't make any difference whether you're assessing at band four or five or six. You're not looking at any different. Um, I do still think, though, you need to concentrate on your overall message um, and put vocabulary and grammar last when you're practicing, if you like, um, because those are things you check last. And they should you should try to make this a natural part of the language rather than the main focus. Thanks. A second question from Laura Della Piana, who asks, how important are paragraphs? Must I divide the text into paragraphs? If you're aiming for a higher level band score, then paragraphs are essential. Um, and you should even think about paragraph writing task one, um, as well as writing task two. Um, they are a very important part of um, cohesion and coherence and in making sure that your ideas are organized in a logical way. And it's described that way within those descriptions. So pay careful attention to exactly how um, the descriptors talk about paragraphing, especially in those higher bands or the bands that you're aiming for. OK, thank you. Um, question now from Saha Azam, who asks, uh, what's an overview in describing a process? OK, that's a very good point, because the overview is a very important part of your task. Um, you're asked to summarize the information. And the overview really is you looking at the tasking and saying, what exactly am I looking at here? And describing what that is. So your overview is, is a nice summary of exactly what you're looking at in the visual information. Um, that's basically what we mean by that. Okay, thanks. A uh, question now from Francesca Sweeney Adrilati, who says, often samples of task one don't have conclusions. Are conclusions expected in reports? No, you don't need to make any sort of conclusion um, in a writing task one. Basically, you're not ask, being asked for your own opinion of the data that you're looking at which is what you're essentially doing with the conclusion. You're, you're giving your own personal response um, to what you're looking at. And you're never asked to do that in writing task one. So no, you don't need to write any sort of conclusion in writing task one. Thanks. A uh, question now from Giovanna um, Campasso, who says, uh, are American English words or American English spellings allowed? Absolutely, yes. Um, IELTS is a very international test. And so if you're studying in America, then of course you're going to be using um, American spellings and, and so on. What I would um, say is to just be aware if you studied in various countries or using various resources that you are consistent with your spelling. So for example, if, if uh, throughout your writing task you've used a typical British spelling, and then just one word you write in an American way, so for example, the word color or flavor, for example, without a U, um, that's going to look like a spelling mistake rather than a US spelling of a word. So be consistent is the most important message there. Thank you. Question now from Irina 
Sisnitskaya, who says, uh, how important is punctuation? Again, if you're aiming for the higher band, it's very important. By band seven and eight, we should see very clear control of, of pronunciation. Um, so accurate use of uh, commas as well as full stops and capital letters. And down in the lower bands, uh, we can find sentences without capital letters and without full stops and so on. And those are lower level mistakes. But as we go higher the bands, we see a lot greater control and accuracy and use of, of punctuation. So yes, very important. Thank you. And we've got time just for one final question, which um, came from a number of people. Um, I've got a problem uh, people today, um, with writing too much, uh, the 200 to 250 words for task one, 300 to 350 words on task two. Is that a problem? I think it is a problem, and it is a common problem as well uh, for um, for candidates getting carried away in their response. It's really important to go back to that idea that you're being asked to write in a very controlled and accurate and precise way, which is where the planning idea is absolutely essential. If you plan, I don't think that you would go over. When you go over in your word length, you're going usually beyond the task because the task has been tested and trialed and it can be answered within that word limit within that time. If you're going to be writing more than you're asked to produce, then you're probably going beyond what the task is asking you to do. You'll also, if you go over for task one, be stealing time from task two, which is worth more points or worth more marks. So you should really train yourself not to do that. So really try to plan your answer, which will help you stick to that word limit that you're given. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline, for another wonderfully interesting, helpful, and very professional webinar. So don't forget, everyone, that um, next week at the usual time of 3 p.m. on uh, GMT on Tuesday, Lynn Durant will be joining us for a talk on creating a stimulating classroom for very young learners. You can sign up for that on our events page. Thank you, everyone, who's attended today and all the webinars we've been running with Pauline. And thank you very much, Pauline. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye.